So now I have the great honor of presenting our keynote, Professor Rajni Nado. Rajni Nado is Professor and Director of the International Center for Higher Education Management, University of Bath. She graduated from the Universities of Cambridge and Natal. Professor Nado has acted as an expert advisor to international bodies and has been involved in research programs relating to social justice, public good, and the academic profession. She was previously the Honorary Secretary of the Society for Research in Higher Education and sits today on the Research and Development Steering Committee of the European Foundation for Management and Development. She is an editorial board member of several scientific journals and she co-edits a book series on global higher education. Her research focuses on transformations in global political economy and higher education chains, with a focus on competition and markets, new forms of imperialism, and the contribution of universities to global well-being. She has developed uh, delivered keynotes on a wide range of countries and presented the 2016 annual World Wars lecture in Canada. Today, her keynote is titled The Competition Fetish as an Imperative of Chains, Animators, Mediators and Consequences. So I am most honored and excited and would be very grateful if you would help me welcome to the stage Professor Naidu. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome. <laughs> so, dear colleagues, thank you very, very much for being here. Um, and I want to start off by thanking Professor Theo Verbals, um, the ERA Council, and the Conference Organizing uh, Committee. Uh, particularly uh, Dr. Katja Broker. I also want to thank Daniela Priest and all the people this morning who have helped me uh, so much. Thank you very, very much. And of course, to the chair of the session, Professor Satu Perella Lutunen. We are often told that we need to change. The reason we need to change is because of competition. And how do we change? We need to compete. Indeed, competition has become such a strong imperative that I refer to it as a competition fetish. I draw from anthropology, political economy, and psychoanalysis. From anthropology, the fetish is a belief in something that has the power to make our desires come true and protect us from harm. Political economy refers to screening the underlying relations of production. Relations between people are translated into connections between things. From psychoanalysis, we find a twofold displacement. The fetish conceals while giving meaning to a substitute. The fetish has the power to deny. The fetish has the power to invoke fear. And the fetish has the power to enthrall. Borrowing from these meanings, higher education can be seen to be trapped in a kind of magical thinking which fetishizes competition. There is a modern day magical belief that competition will provide the solution to all the problems in education. 
Competition will protect us from risk. Competition will enhance quality and competition will also promote equity. There are many varieties of competition in higher education. These different types of competition displace one another, they combine with one another, and they also develop into new hybrid forms. I would like to outline four different types of competition. The first form of competition relates to what Pierre Bourdieu has termed scientific capital. Scholars have long engaged in various forms of competition, including the symbolic destruction of rival scholarship. These strategies drew on criteria that were valorized within the field of university education. The hierarchical ordering of subjects and universities was thus internally judged. It was judged inside the field by internal criteria. And it was projected to the outside world. This competition is still dominant, but it is being mediated by other forms. The second form of, of competition is the contribution of higher education to geopolitical rivalry. David Harvey has asserted that we live in an era of the new imperialism. Dominant Western states have been joined by rapidly rising powers such as China. Borders are penetrated, borders are erased, and borders are transformed by political and economic measures. These give access to raw materials, to markets, and to strategic geopolitical positions. International organizations and global for-profit corporations intertwine in complex ways with governments in these geopolitical games. Higher education stands at the center of such struggles. First, it has changed into a global commodity for economic advantage. Second, higher education is deployed in a race for influence. Powerful groups assert their own preferred political, economic, and cultural models. This has always been happening indirectly through the hidden curriculum and also through organizations such as the British Council and more recently, the Confucius Institutes. More recently, however, more explicit attempts have been made. In Iowa, in the USA, a Republican senator has proposed a bill to force public universities to consider the political affiliation of faculty before hiring them. A further example is the threat to close the Central European University in Hungary. Often, the economic and the political are mutually reinforcing. Eva Hartmann's work reveals how the export of Bologna to Africa and Latin America increases Europe's share of higher education in terms of a market, but it also, uh, it also increases Europe's sphere of influence. Susan Robertson and Matt Kozetsky show the multifaceted factors that are leading to Malaysia, to Singapore, to South Korea, and China becoming rival destinations for students from the West. The third type of competition is government-sponsored competition. These are generally termed excellence policies. 
as the seminal paper by Rosemary Deem, Kaho Mock, and Lisa Lucas show, the core political aim is to identify world-class universities. These are universities that are expected to compete on the global stage. Funding is diverted to these universities to provide positional competition. The fourth type of competition is status competition. Wendy Brown has noted that universities shape speculative value through global rankings. We know that rankings do not measure holistic performance, and we know that rankings undermine institutional diversity. And yet, as Simon Marginson has shown, a significant number of universities across the world all strive to be part of the ranking game, even when there is little capacity to feature in such ranking. I want to turn now to the factors that constitute the competition fetish in higher education. After all, the fetish is just an inanimate object until it is made alive. What is it that breathes life into the fetish? Here, in keeping with the fetish metaphor, I introduce the term shaman. What are the shamanic actors and structures that have the power to constitute and reproduce competition? There are many. For example, Miguel Antonio Lim has written about ranking agencies as powerful shamans. However, for the purposes of this presentation, I will focus on three macro actors and three micro actors. In many countries, the government is a key shamanic actor. The competition state in many regions across the world is rising and rising. It is a state that has abandoned public welfare. Instead, it focuses on promoting returns from market forces in international settings. There is increasing articulation between the state and the market. Governments create the conditions for the market to operate, and the market helps the government achieve political goals. At the same time, certain governments are linking the neoliberal project to xenophobic identity politics, combined with promises for new forms of protectionism. We are seeing this particularly in the UK and in the USA. Secondly, international organizations also play a key shamanic role. The World Bank embeds neoliberalism through structural adjustment programs, through conditions attached to loans, and prescriptions for what they term good governance. Low-income countries are urged to deregulate and to open up to international competition. Organizations like the OECD also shape the action of key actors through global assessment, through benchmarking, and through policy comparison. Manuel Cardosa and Gita Steiner Kamsi have shown us how educational systems are made comparable through standardized measurement. These serve as pro projection screens to urge policymakers to move education reform in a certain direction. This form of coercive social construction can be seen if we look at the example of Sweden and Norway. These countries were once positioned as role models 
for education. However, the principles of Nordic systems have now been challenged by international ideals of neoliberal competition. They are now positioned by the OECD as countries in need for reform. Third, global corporations have become very potent political actors. They have a clear agenda. They push as deeply as they can to open up public sector education to for-profit companies. Powerful transnational corporations have penetrated deep into governments to influence the inner workings of democracy. They are now part of the policy community. Here, they are able to influence regulation, which enables their own aggressive expansion. But we also have actors inside the university. Some university leaders and managers have become what Jürgen Enders and I have called audit market intermediaries. At their most extreme, they prize open, they translate, and they reinforce competition and audit mechanisms. They bring these mechanisms into the heart of the university. At the same time, the external pressures for competition are used as a tool to leverage managerial control and power over academics. And finally, faculty and students also play their part. Competition is so powerful because it borrows legitimacy from elite scientific capital. Academics are seduced by competition. Academics are coerced by competition. Competition is protected by the elite because it replicates the principles which put them in an advantage position. Their success validates the economic and social underpinnings of the various games. In this way, the academic elite is incorporated to stall protest and to help with the pacification and the depoliticization of the sector as a whole. And what about students? Students, in their conception as consumers, activate consumer mechanisms such as student choice, such as the National Student Satisfaction Surveys, and complaint mechanisms. However, at the same time, as the work of Manya shows us, student organizations in many countries are beginning to resist neoliberalism. I want to turn now to look at competition as a ritual Shamans perform rituals to exert power over beliefs, over desires, and over emotions. The anthropologist Pierre Smith has analyzed the importance of mind snares. This is the way in which the mind is trapped by rituals. He writes that instead of a clear an exact meaning, the ritual involves an evocative process. It's a process which stimulates and simulates, but keeps the inferential process idle. This allows the mind to slip and to fall into the trap that was set for it. So what are the mind snares of competition in higher education? Firstly, we are told that competition is completely natural. Thus, Darwinian natural selection is fused with what Bourdieu has called doxa. This is an unquestionable orthodoxy that operates 
as if it were the objective truth. Competition is deeply, deeply inscribed as common sense. To question competition is to be insane. It is also an act of heresy because competition, especially market competition, is seen as central to democracy. The more areas of human life that we subsume under market competition, the more democratic and the more civilized we appear to be. The second mind snare is that competition is legitimate and competition is just. So competition depends on making believe that all participants have an equal opportunity. Riyadh Shah Jahan and Clara Morgan demonstrate that most global competitions are rigged. They demonstrate how the OECD, in attempting its assessment of higher education learning outcomes, created spaces of equivalence across very, very different countries with very different geographic, political, and economic contexts. However, these contexts were universalized, they were delocalized, and they were, and they were depoliticized so that they could be presented as legitimate competition measures. Hannah and Liana also show us how global competition valorizes templates that derive from centers of power. We also see this in the work of Andrea Abbas and uh, Lizzie Milligan. So less powerful nations and universities are forced to mimic these characteristics even when they have no chance of winning. Another very interesting aspect is the whole issue of meritocracy. Meritocracy is positioned as just. Meritocracy is a cornerstone of the university. However, Pierre Bourdieu has shown us how meritocracy acts as both a relay and a cloak to obscure economic and social inequalities. As Joe Lidler shows us, oops, sorry, as Joe Lidler shows us, meritocracy endorses a linear hierarchical system in which the top simply cannot exist without the bottom. The classic meritoc meritocratic symbol is a ladder. Raymond Williams has argued that the ladder offers the opportunity to climb, but you can only go up the ladder alone. Raymond Williams asserted that merit meritocracy has sweetened the poison of hierarchy. It tells us that we can reward talent rather than money or birth, but at the same time, it weakens community, it weakens solidarity, and it weakens collective well-being. In many social democratic countries, measures have been implemented to create greater equality of opportunity within meritocracy. However, even this is being rolled back in many, many countries. We now have a new version of meritocracy that is rising. It is a version that is opposed to welfare support. It's opposed to contextualized systems of merit. Instead, as Joe Littler shows, meritocracy is once again becoming unashamedly elitist and linked to plutocracy. 
The third mind snare is that competition is efficient and competition is effective. But what evidence do we have that competition is effective in all areas of higher education? Who gains and who loses? Are there problems that competition actually cannot solve? Are there problems that competition creates? The fourth mind snare works through emotions. Katja Broger has shows us how competition can produce an effective politics of naming, shaming, and faming. It is the fear of shame and the thrill of fame that ignites in all of us a strong competitive desire. In addition, it is now a moral imperative to be willing to enter the competition. Academics and students and managers are encouraged to pursue their self-interest and to maximize their gains. For those who are unable to enter the competition, they are now seen as lacking in aspiration. Lauren Bellant talks about cruel optimism. This is the affective state, the emotional state, that is produced under neoliberal culture. It is cruel because it encourages an attachment to the idea of a better future. In reality, she says, such attachments are actively impeded for a majority of people by the harsh realities of neoliberalism. I want to turn now to look at some consequences. Wendy Brown and others have shown us that competition, particularly neoliberal competition, generates extreme inequalities of wealth, precarious and disposable communities, and an unholy intimacy between capital and governments. In higher education, too, the consequences are no less dramatic. The first consequence is inequality. The different forms of competition come together to reproduce old hierarchies and channel new forms of inequality, both inside and across national higher education systems. These are always competitions that are rigged towards the elite. At the apex of the competition, the battle for world-class universities rages. It is a battle that is fought between the most elite universities in the most powerful countries. Barbara Kem and her colleagues have shown us how the German Excellence Initiative has resulted in more stratification, a downgrading of teaching, and an additional administrative burden. In highly stratified systems, there is no downward trickle. Instead, there is an upward spiral of resources and status. The elite is consolidated, while everything else is undermined. This results in what I have termed the combined and uneven development of higher education worldwide. High status, well-resourced universities in poor countries are intimately connected to the global power nodes of higher education. At the same time, there is a proliferation of under-resourced universities in the richest countries in the world. These recruit the most disadvantaged students. These are under-resourced, these are penalized, and they are detached from power and very often um, sorry, confined to their localities. So one of the most important functions of competition is competition legitimates inequality. 
we never ever hear policymakers saying we need more inequality. What we hear policymakers saying is we need more competition. The so called invisible hand of competition provides the means by which no one is responsible for the negative effects apart from the victims themselves. I want to turn now to look at academic work. The competition fetish has the potential to colonize epistemic and professional frameworks. Mark Olson has shown us how in the UK, the UK's research excellence framework has militated against blue skies research. It has encouraged dubious tactics for maximizing citations, and it has encouraged conformity rather than innovation. The looming transatlantic trade and investment partnership is likely to increase pressures for the profit potential of research. The danger is that research that has a public good function, including research that calls truth to the power of the corporate government complex will be sidelined. Competition can also be very, very insidious. And here I want to give you an example from my own context. In business schools, we have a list of journals, an official list, and that list ranks journals from one star to four stars. The best result for the past research excellent exercise was to get four articles published in four star journals. So you would get 16 points. And what we've realized is the way in which academics now talk in business schools has changed. We talk about whether a person is a four-pointer or a 16-pointer. We talk about whether the journal is a four-star journal or a one-star journal. The intellectual content of the work has become completely invisible. Research has been translated into a simple numeric score that can be ranked by those who manage the research competition. In terms of teaching, we know now very well some of the dangers of the reconceptualization of students as consumers, both in terms of students who, um, where it has some very, very negative effects on, on their learning. For example, they opt for um, instrumental learning, more surface learning, they lose responsibility for learning, and they gain entitlement. This, of course, is very different in different countries, in different subjects, uh, and when you look at postgraduate and undergraduate students. But what's interesting, that academics also fall prey to consumerist um, pressures. They use gaming strategies to enhance their student satisfaction scores. They opt for safe, risk-free, spoon-feeding teaching. I'm currently engaged in a research project with Matt Elverson from the University of Lund and Stephanie Gustafsson. And we are interviewing young academics who come from the continent and who come to England. And our reason is that we feel that academics in the UK, we've had this drip by drip process of new public management and auditing and competition. And we've got used to it, and we've got used to playing the game. But for young people who come from a more Humboldtian uh, institution, we think that this might be quite an interesting difference to the system. And our early findings are really very, very interesting. We find that they feel that their professional identity is seriously undermined by the lack of trust in the English system. 
they also have huge concerns about the erosion of quality. And this is interesting because one of the reasons they've moved to the UK is because they see it as such high quality. They worry that they are expected to actually achieve high student satisfaction scores, no matter what. And if they don't, they are in, pro in trouble with their probation. And this really changes the whole idea for them of what it means to be a professional, what it means to be a good teacher, what it means to be a responsible teacher. And of course, in England, we also have the teaching excellence framework. This is the newest reform in a cascade of neoliberal market reform. As Joshua Forenza has argued, the teaching excellence framework is less about teaching excellence and more about allowing universities to charge differential fees. It's less about students and more about an imagined group of employers. It ignores how a focus on student satisfaction can actually lower quality, and it simply pretends that social class and university status do not impact on a graduate salary. I want to also talk about what I see as the very real dangers of the deprofessionalization of the academic profession. The transformation of higher education into a status and an, econ and an economic commodity is likely to further the deprofessionalization of the academic profession and harden stratification. Academic work is likely to become more configured into standardized units, which can be priced and sold. Knowledge is likely to be codified, including an attempt to codify tacit knowledge. Tasks are likely to be standardized and outputs quantified. Academic work will become subject to managerial principles for supervision and control. While an academic elite may be able to engage in resistance, in symbolic compliance, and in buffering, a growing number of academics, particularly those who are coming into the system, will face work intensification, casualization, a lack of autonomy, and growing insecurity. There is a danger that they will be perceived to be exchangeable and disposable. In my final section now, I want to turn to how we can mediate some of the most corrosive effects of the competition fetish. The first thing to say is that there was never a golden age of higher education. Higher education has always contributed to inequality. Teaching has suffered because of research, and quality has been uneven. But I think it is very important to understand what has caused these issues and the extent to which competition can actually provide a solution. Are there other solutions? The second thing to say is that perhaps, and I have a big perhaps here, perhaps not all competition is negative. We know that traditional academic competition has resulted in huge intellectual advances. More recently, new types of competition have been suggested. This changes the definition of success and rewards universities for value-added work. For example, universities could be rewarded for recruiting disadvantaged students and enabling them to succeed. But what I am arguing against is the idea of competition as a fetish, that different types of competition 
can be unthinkingly applied to answer all the problems of higher education. I am concerned that competition has become so powerful that other ways of organizing are rendered obsolete. That every time we talk about collective action, coordination, or even planning, we are accused at best of being quaintly old fashioned or at worst of being anti democratic. Our research needs to challenge the conviction that there is no alternative to competition. We need to challenge the classical economic and neo Darwinian view that individuals are only capable of acting out of self interest. In his book, The Moral Economy, Samuel Bowles makes the case that appeals made to our self interest can undercut intrinsic moral impulses. He argues that this causes institutions to actually work suboptimally. Eleanor Ostrom, um, the first woman to win the Nobel Prize for Economics, and her colleagues have documented thousands of cases where people come together to collaborate for the public good. She has challenged the idea that people are trapped into competitive behavior, which in the end will destroy all our common resources. For example, the usual example that is given of two communities that live on a lake. They will compete to fish on the lake until the lake is fish dry. Her own fieldwork in Nepal, in Spain, in Japan and Indonesia reveals that actually people are not the greedy, selfish actors of standard economic theory. Her fieldwork showed examples of people coming together to decide on quotas of fish or using fish nets with larger holes so that young fish are not caught. People developed rules, they developed trust, and they developed sanctions. In these ways, a natural resource was made available for their children's children. She revealed to the world that individuals can organize themselves in combination with diverse polycentric and local organizations beyond the state and beyond the market that we can share and we can sustain rather than compete and deplete. We know this from higher education. Our day-to-day -day life shows hundreds of examples of compassion, of courage, and of collaboration, despite the pressures that are put upon us. There are also some very inspirational examples in other countries beyond the Anglo-Saxon world and beyond Europe. For example, in Mexico, universities come together to resist huge amounts of public reform. In Colombia, research, universe, uh, research intensive universities are coming together to develop a major peace program to bring uh, the guerrillas back in and to obtain peace in, in Colombia. The movement for cooperative universities also stands as uh, a very good and inspirational example. For example, the social science center in Lincoln in the United Kingdom. A more established higher education uh, cooperative is the University of Mondragon, founded in 1997 in the Basque region in northern Spain. Sue Wright and, Colet and her colleagues undertook a field trip to this university. They have hailed the university as a hugely successful, successful alternate to the neoliberalized 
university formation. They stated, it is possible to create and manage successful universities that do not involve the exploitation of faculty as passive employees and the treatment of students as mere clients. I want to end by stating that higher education is too important to be left to a fetish. Bourdieu has written very powerfully about how neoliberalism has systematically destroyed collectives. We need to find ways through our research and through our practice to re-collectivize. We need to find ways to sustain the small and the big acts of resistance. We need to find ways together as policymakers, as researchers, as teachers, and as managers, and as students, to find new visions and alternative ways to organize. Thank you very, very much for your attention, and I look forward to the discussion.